I think it is quite commonly known that the relationship between Scotland and her southern neighbour England has, for a large portion of history at least, been, well, troublesome. Throughout the Middle Ages there have been frequent border clashes and wars between those countries, with both sides trying to dominate over the other. And yet, in 1707, they unified into the United Kingdom of Great Britain. What were the reasons that eventually led to this game-changing moment? Why was the Scottish Parliament suddenly willing to give up its independence like that? Our story begins with one of the most notable monarchs in British history, or rather, her death. When Queen Elizabeth I died childless in 1603, James IV inherited the English throne as his great-grandmother, Margaret Tudor, was also Henry VIII's sister. As James I of England, he set about creating a unified state with one single parliament. This venture turned out to be a lot harder than he had initially thought. Both the Parliament in London as well as the Parliament in Edinburgh were not really keen on endangering their very existence, so they blocked any significant and meaningful legislative change. It would appear as though King James had unsuccessfully tried to remove a century-old rivalry in just a few years. The English were worried about losing some of their liberties while the Scots feared incorporation into England. In the end, the Union of Crowns did not create a United Kingdom, and the laws, political institutions and the churches remained vastly different. In 1688, the Catholic King James VII and II was deposed in favour of the Protestant Stadtholder William of Orange, who then became William III in England and William II in Scotland, in the end that would subsequently be known as the Glorious Revolution. This resulted in the Stuart dynasty's end of their rule over Britain and confirmed Parliament's authority over the monarch. In the late 1600s, both economies had somewhat grown together and were largely complementing each other. Over time, however, Scotland started to develop its own economic ambitions and no longer wanted to play the role of junior partner. The Union of the Crowns often pulled Scotland into wars against its most lucrative trading partners. Furthermore, the English decided to impose high tariffs on Scottish imports. All this only worsened the already difficult situation Scotland found herself in. The climate was just too wet and cold to guarantee rich harvests. Many natural resources such as lead or coal could not be extracted simply because of lacking financial means. Even the Dutch regularly used their massive navies to steal some fish off the Scottish coast. You only need to take a look at the GDP of the two countries to see just how massive the wealth disparity between them was. True, England had a vastly bigger population, five times as big to be precise, but still accounted for 87% of Britain's GDP. One of the reasons for England's wealth was its many colonies and trading posts all over the world, controlled by the almighty East India Company. But although the two countries were ruled by the same monarch, Scottish merchants were excluded from England's lucrative overseas trade by law. This left Scotland's economy in a very precarious situation, with very little room for manoeuvre. And so, the Scottish Parliament decided to partake in this whole colonisation business, too. It should be noted that Scotland had already made quite a few colonisation attempts prior to this point. The first was a settlement on the island of Nova Scotia in 1629, which got attacked and devastated by the French. In 1680, Scotland paired up with England to colonise New Jersey, with Scotland taking care of the eastern half. Emigration there slowed down significantly after the motherland got hit by a bunch of massive famines a mere 10 days later. In 1684, a settlement in Carolina was wiped out by the Spanish. This time would be different, however, argued a certain trader who went by the name of William Patterson. He had developed the idea of establishing a settlement on the Darien Isthmus in Panama a few years earlier, and would forever be obsessed with it from that fateful day onward. The plan sounded promising and surprisingly simple. A trading colony in Panama would allow the Scots to simultaneously trade with the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean, which means that the long and dangerous journey around Cape Horn could be avoided completely. There was just one tiny little problem. Panama, like most of the Americas at the time, already belonged to the Spanish Empire. Patterson wasn't too worried about it, because there was no active Spanish military presence in and around the desired area, therefore leaving the door open for Scottish colonisation. This was enough to convince the directors of the Company of Scotland. After all, Patterson was a skilled salesman who was firmly convinced of the idea that money creates more money. As one of the founders of the Bank of England, he is sure to understand the complex mechanisms in the financial world. He also knew the area well enough, as he had travelled to the Caribbean as a merchant just a few years earlier. In 1695, the Company of Scotland trading to Africa and the Indies was founded as an equivalent to the English East India Company, with a complete monopoly over trade to India, America and Africa. 
initially its headquarter was situated in London, but after just one short year, they were forced to move to Edinburgh by direct orders of King William, who disapproved of the newly created competition to English trade superiority. All that was left to do now was to raise the money for this expensive venture. Fortunately for the company, enthusiasm was high across the country. This colony had the potential of granting Scotland economic modernisation and bringing it on par with all the other European countries. It was seen as the only way out of the ungrateful dependency on England and widespread poverty. Potential settlers saw an opportunity to acquire a piece of fertile farmland in the New World and start a new life. And so, people from all social classes invested their money to the course, ranging from a communally collected £100 right up to £3,000. Over the span of just six months, the company managed to raise over £400,000, or the equivalent of £75 million a day. To put that into perspective, over 40% of the country's capital were now in the company's hands. On the 14th of July 1698, five ships left Edinburgh with 1,200 people on board. Among them were William Patterson himself and his wife. No one on board seemed to care too much that Patterson had never been to Darien before, or that his imagination of the place was solely based on the accounts of a Welsh privateer called Lionel Waffer. Waffer suffered an accident at the Isthmus and was abandoned by his crewmates. Luckily, the local Kuna Indians kindly took care of him and gave him the chance to document the area as well as the native population. His widely exaggerated accounts described Darien as paradise on earth. Obviously, the question of why the Spaniards didn't take advantage of this seemingly perfect spot arose, but it was ignorantly explained with Spanish stupidity. Because, apparently, some bloke who wrote a book with the clear intention of making it as sensationalistic as possible was seen as more knowledgeable than the people who actually owned the place. At the end of October in the same year, all five ships reached the promised land. It was quickly decided that they should settle at a three and a half kilometer long bay that offered enough space to dock big sail ships. Nearby was a small peninsula on which a fort could be erected. The area was rich in banana trees, cedar trees and cotton trees. The forest was inhabited by anteaters, sloths and many other animals that were completely unknown to the Scots. The Kuna welcomed the newcomers in a very friendly manner and even agreed to a treaty of mutual assistance. They also told of a mountain rich in gold just a few kilometers away. For the Scots, this truly appeared to be paradise on earth. Could there be any better place for a trade settlement? They proudly named their colony New Caledonia after the Latin name of their home country. The settlement itself was called New Edinburgh. All affairs were controlled and organized by a council of seven, which Patterson was also a part of. The men quickly started with the construction of their new city. Trees were chopped, a wooden fort was constructed, cannons were set up, fruits were harvested, and everything went according to plan. Just a few days later, however, the situation started to get worse and worse. It all started with King William tasking Captain Richard Long to find the colony and to immediately report back to him. Long managed to locate the settlement shortly after. This was also the time when the Scots started to realise just why the Spaniards had never truly bothered to establish a colony here. The area was riddled with diseases such as cholera, typhus, malaria or smallpox. Many inhabitants quickly succumbed to the illnesses. Among them was Patterson's wife, who died on the 14th of November. Additionally, food started to become scarce. The ships were only sparsely equipped with food because of bad harvest in Scotland. Plant diseases and insects complicated the cultivation of sugar, corn, oranges and lemons. The five fishing nets they brought from Scotland were nowhere near enough to sustain an entire colony. It even came to the point where the settlers were forced to eat tree bark. Only four weeks after their arrival, some ten colonists already attempted to escape into the jungle in search of food. After their return two days later, they were chained up and fed with nothing but bread and water. Now that didn't stop more people from escaping this hellhole. On Christmas Eve, a messenger was sent back to Scotland with information regarding the state of the colony and the call for assistance. But the ship encountered heavy waves upon leaving the harbour and was smashed into pieces. 24 people died. By the time March 1699 rolled around, 200 people were already dead. A ship that was sent to the nearby Dutch outpost of Curacao was seized by the Spanish and all its goods were confiscated. Shortly after the Spaniards attacked the colony on land to demonstrate that they still hold the big dig status in the region. But still, the Scottish pioneers refused to give up. New houses were built, new palisades were erected, and the hope for fresh supplies to arrive was still holding strong. 
at this point, it's fair to say that the colony had already failed because now Scotland had to deliver goods over to the New World and not the other way around. But those supplies never came. By April, every second settler had already fallen ill to some sort of tropical disease. The final blow came on the 18th of May. On that day, King William forbade all English merchants to trade or exchange news with Darien on the grounds that the Scots had violated the peace with Spain. The intention behind this was to gain Spain's fragile favour towards England as they were a vital ally in a potential war against France. There was no more hope left. Despite Patterson's pleadings, the majority of people just wanted to leave. On the 16th of July, Patterson had to be carried on board of one of his ships because a strong fever had made him unable to walk. Only six days later were the weather conditions good enough for the few remaining colonists to leave the base safely. Their suffering didn't end there. Countess Moore died of fever on the journey. Out of 1,200 people, only 300 would make it back to Scotland. Patterson tried to justify himself for his failures to the directors of the Company of Scotland by blaming the lack of provisions and the poor quality of the trade goods, instead of admitting that it was his abysmally terrible planning skills and his naivety that drove this project into the wall. And still, he didn't get fired. Probably because the company realised that they too were responsible by allowing Patterson to carry out his vision, and because the entire company was bound to this project. The Scottish population put most of the blame on the English and their king. Not entirely unjustified, as William was still the King of Scotland after all, and yet decided to let the colony fail. What Patterson didn't know was that a second expedition with 1,300 people had already been sent out to Darien prior to his arrival. The directors of the company had no idea just how terrible everything was going. When the new colonists arrived in November, they found nothing but a destroyed fort and a few burnt down houses. Before they could seriously rebuild anything, the Spanish besieged Darien and cut off its access to fresh water. The settlers had no choice but to surrender. In April, they left the port of Darien. Two of the four ships were sunk in a storm and another crashed on the shores of Cuba. In the end, about 2,000 people paid with their lives and the country was financially ruined. William Patterson himself lost his wife and child. And still, he never let go of his dream until his death in 1719. Today, the area of New Edinburgh is called Puerto Escoces and is still completely uninhabited. All of a sudden, the prospect of a united Great Britain didn't seem to abstract anymore. England saw herself in a much better position now that Scotland's economy was in complete shambles. Still, both sides could profit. England could make sure that Scotland didn't ally itself with France and expose its northern border, while Scotland could access the English overseas market and restore its economy. Shortly before his death in 1702, King William encouraged both parliaments to enter talks regarding unification. Queen Anne then appointed several negotiators from both countries. Talks came to a halt a year later for the following reasons. Firstly, many English aristocrats preferred a weaker Scotland over an equal counterpart. Secondly, the Scots feared that the comparatively high English tax rate would also be applied to Scotland, which could bring further economic hardship. Thirdly, there were religious differences between Anglicans and Presbyterians that couldn't be resolved. And fourthly, England was despised by the Scottish population. The southern neighbour was still largely blamed for the scheme's failure. Still, English representatives in the Scottish Parliament tried to make Scotland join England's war against France and, funnily enough, Spain, a country whose favour they had so hardly tried to gain. Edinburgh refused, and instead passed the so-called Security Act, which gave Scotland the power to decline England's call for arms and to reinstate their own king. In a very panicked response, London passed the Act for the Effectual Securing the Kingdom of England from the apparent dangers that may arise from several acts lately passed in the Parliament of Scotland, also known as the Alien Act. It was essentially an ultimatum that threatened the Scottish with a prohibition on the import of coal, linen and cattle should they settle the succession by December 1705. Threatening Scotland with even more financial hardship might seem extreme, and it certainly was. But it was just the lengths that England was willing to go in order to prevent the Stuarts from ever regaining the throne. With this, anti-English sentiment reached its pinnacle. This becomes apparent with the capture of the Worcester, an English merchant ship. The Worcester was seized in the Firth of Forth when she tried to dock at the local port to escape a raging storm. The captain, Thomas Green, and his crew were accused of attacking a Scottish vessel in the Indian Ocean. Green and two of his crew members were found guilty and sentenced to death despite there being no evidence against them whatsoever. 
matters became especially awkward when the survivors of the supposedly attacked Scottish vessel arrived in England and confirmed the Worcester's innocence in the matter. But it was too late. The Scottish Parliament failed to calm down the angry mob and proceeded with the executions. Thomas Green and his two unfortunate crewmates were hanged in front of a giant crowd. Shortly after the incident, this heartwarming poem was released. A pill for the poor Ketis, or a Scots lancet for an English swelling. Then England for its treachery should mourn, be forced to form and truckle in its turn. Scots peddlers you no longer burst up braid, and Darien should with interest be repaid. No matter how deep the hatred towards the English was, Scotland had no choice but to re-enter negotiations regarding union. Both parliaments appointed 31 members each and talks lasted for three months, starting in April 1706. England wanted a united kingdom with a single parliament base in Westminster and a Hanoverian ruler. Scotland on the other hand wanted free trade throughout the entirety of Great Britain and the colonies. Particularly interesting however is Article 15. In it Scotland is guaranteed £400,000 in compensation for all the money it lost at Darien. You might as well call it bribery because many shareholders were also members of the Scottish Parliament who liked to see their money returned. On the 16th of January 1707, Edinburgh voted in favour of uniting the two countries once and for all. Scotland had suffered greatly under the personal union and had always been neglected. A union with England was indeed the only way to go forward. In March, the Queen also gave her blessing and in May, the United Kingdom came into being. Now, just how much of a role did the failure at Darien play? I'm going to completely rely on my own subjective judgement and say, not that big. Yes, the financial ruin did put Scotland in a much weaker negotiating position than it might have been in. In the end though, the union was just too beneficial for both sides. Scotland needed the money, England the security. It is also wrong to assume that the Acts of Union opened the door for complete English domination over Scotland. No, the exact opposite was the case. In 1722, a Scotsman became director of the East India Company. Around 1750, every fourth landowner in Jamaica was Scottish, and so was every fourth regimental officer in the British Army. Tens of thousands of Scottish people emigrated to America, Australia or New Zealand. The British Empire, the biggest empire the world has ever seen, was also a Scottish Empire. <laughs>